Did you know the Ford Sierra and the Ferrari F40 have the same drag coefficient of 0.34? Now you know. Hello, I hope everyone is well. Um, I'm back again. I think it's, this must be the longest gap I've had between videos. It must be all of five days. Such a busy lockdown. Um, I must start off uh, with first with a correction um, from my previous video. My, my opening fact to my previous video was um, that the 4x4 system in the Fiat Panda was developed by Saab. Um, now I said at the beginning of that video that it was the original Panda 4x4, um, which is incorrect. It's actually the second generation newer Panda 4x4 that uh, the four the, the four wheel drive system was developed by Saab. The original uh, Panda 4x4, the four wheel drive system, and that was actually developed by Steyr Puk. Um, so thanks to uh, Andrew Scott who uh, for pointing that out to me um, and making me look like a fool. But I do apologise because because I, I gave you information that just wasn't true, and I, I promised to to work harder not to do this. Also, something else I meant to meant to mention in, in my previous video, um, in a previous previous video. I discussed the uh, the new all electric um, car from Hyundai, the Ionic Five, um, which looked like a quite a quite a handsome thing in the in the studio render images they brought out. Um, it looked quite like the concept. A couple of photos have surfaced of one out in the the wild, shall we put it? And uh, now I'm not so sure. This one doesn't have those funky kind of mesh style wheels um, in the ones in the renders and stuff. But oh, I don't know. It's a bit. It does look like, it looks like a car that should be on the set of uh, Total Recall. And I'm not talking about the Colin Farrell Total Recall, I'm talking about the 90s Schwarzenegger Total Recall. Hmm? Anyway, on to the motoring news of the week. Volvo um, have become the latest addition, um, along with Ford and Jaguar, to announce that they are going to go completely EV. Um, by the end of the decade, 2030, there will be no combustion engine Volvos available at all. Um, they currently only make four cylinders and they're all hybridized anyway, but boom, no more ICEs in Volvos, um, which seems strange because they also have Polestar, which is kind of their sub brand, which is also focusing on EVs, how the two will compete. I don't know, but they're cleverer people than I am. so. I assume they had this all figured out. This announcement was also coincided with the, the release of their newest electric car, the uh, the Volvo C40 Recharge, which um, is a kind of a crossover -y thing. Um, Volvo styling of recently has been fantastic. Some of their cars are just, they're, they're, they're beautiful. They're beautiful pieces of kind of minimalist Scandinavian design, brilliant. This thing, I'm not so sure, the C40 Recharge. The front end is very bluff and bleh, but the rear end, the little spoiler and little kind of like hingy things on the top of the roof. Um, but the worst part about it, this is actually a common thread in a lot of uh, modern car design, especially s smaller dimensioned cars, larger kind of luxury cars, so not so much, but car design is being dictated quite heavily by safety legislation, which is fair enough. Pedestrian safety being one, which causes car designers to kind of work around a lot of strange parameters and it's caused a lot of modern cars to look quite bulbous, especially in the bonnet and front end, again, for make sure passengers don't disintegrate when you hit them. And because they're gone kind of chunkier and taller and stuff, a lot of uh, modern cars have these kind of flat edged wheel arches and that kind of increases, it increases the height of the wheel arch. And then with EVs, this is even worse because all the kind of battery packs and electric ovens are, are housed on the floor, which raises the floor height. And then the crossover thing raises the right height again. So if you look at this C40, from the top of the wheel to where the crease for the wheel arch finally ends, you could probably fit a whole other wheel in there and it just looks terrible. Um, so much so, I'm going to stop talking about the Volvo C40 Recharge now and move on to uh, another EV. Really is a sign of the times where two pieces of news I'm going to discuss um, are both electric vehicles. 
This is about the Audi um, e-tron, which journalists have finally got their hands on and given a bit of a test drive. And again, when I first saw the e-tron, I was like, mm, it's a bit of a fussy mess kind of, I thought. But again, this was from studio renders. Now that I've seen some videos of them actually driving it out in the real world, I really like the way it looks. Um, if I was in the market for a big, expensive EV, it's the one I'd have. The Tesla has better range, is more powerful, and their charging network is better still. But I wouldn't own a Tesla. I just, I just have a thing against Musk, and their build quality is still questionable. I like this e-tron. Um, I'm not in the market for any of these cars, but from what I gather, it's pretty much like a Taycan. Um, you'd only be able to get it in four-wheel drive, where you can get the Taycan now with just rear-wheel drive only. Um, but I'd imagine this is going to be quite a successful car for for Audi. Um, people like Audis anyway. People are really jumping on board on EVs. So best of luck to them with that. So onto some combustion engine news and what would usually be uh, a cause of celebration, especially for me, I, I well, me and my friends, we, you know, in our youth, we kind of grew up in the, the VW scene. I don't, I don't attach my, uh, my colors to any brand anymore, but you know, we were one of those, the, one of that crew. Folks, I'm gonna brought out the, um, the anniversary version of the, the Golf GTI, which has come out quite soon with all the rest of the Mark 8 Golf GTIs. Um, so this is the, the, the 40, 45th anniversary um, of the Golf GTI. Now they've kind of latched it onto the Club Sport, which you've already seen, um, which means it's pretty much identical mechanically. And um, there's a few little bits of styling tweaks, different wheels. Um, I think you get the Akrapovic exhaust as standard. <sighs> lazy like i just i just don't care for the mark 8 but the sad thing about this is that the anniversary or the special editions of, of of the golf gti's have always kind of been a, a thing to really kind of uh celebrate as, as i've just said but this is just a club sport with some some bits attached to it to make it seem like the even better model now let's go back to the history of the uh of the GTI Special Editions. So the Mark One, which is, you know, the, the, the godfather of the Golf GTI, and some think, you know, the godfather of the hot hatch, but that's up for debate. They didn't have an anniversary then, because, well, you know, they didn't know how where, where the future was going, but they did bring out the um the, the, the Mark One GTI campaign, which got the 1.8 liter engine, um, and it got these funky Pirelli wheels, which you're probably familiar with, but had peas cut out of them. And, you know, just, it was it was a nicely well specced Golf GTI, um, and it's the one to have now if, if you're if you're looking for one. Then the Mark II came along. Again, there was no anniversary version, um, and there was no kind of like, hooray, the Golf GTI is great. Um, but they did bring out some crazy special editions with the, with the Mark II, um, it, and probably the best of the bunch there was the uh, the GTI Limited or the Golf Limited, as they call it. I don't think they actually call it a GTI, which was a G60 supercharged. 200 ish horsepower four wheel drive version of the golf it was only available in left hand drive i think they only made a thousand of them possibly less than that um very cool car then of course the mark three golf came along and people were like it's not really that good it's not really it's probably one of the least uh one of the least favored of the golfs the mark three and the gti was a bit fat and slow the Mark III was the first one of the actual anniversary uh, versions, so this would have been the uh, the twentieth anniversary of the Golf GTI. So it came out in nineteen seventy six. So this must have come out in nineteen ninety six. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, again, not many, no mechanical tweaks. Um, but it was a nice looking car. A nice set of BBS wheels came on it. Golf 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 ball gear stick. Nice uh, different interior. Recaro seats with this special anniversary. Uh, trim on it again look the mark 3 was not a great car but if, if you have to have a golf gti the anniversary one is probably the one to have they even did a couple of uh, diesel versions in left hand drive only and um, things really started coming on song for the mark 4 again the mark 4 golf gti not the best uh, hot hatch ever it wasn't really lacking for power um, especially when they when they finally gave it the, the 1.8 t engine rather than the, the 150 brake earlier versions you got we went up power went up to 180 brake um but the thing about it was it it, it got you know it got some 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 
they got bigger brakes, some tweak suspension, um, and it looked great. I had these, uh, I think they were called BBS CHs, but these like pseudo uh, center knockoff BBS wheels, which really suited it. The Mark IV Golf's a good looking car anyway. It got some, you know, a new front valance, some nice paintwork. And again, you could actually get a TDI version of the, uh, of the anniversary Golf. It's a bit of a strange one though, because in the US, um, it was actually called the 20th anniversary because they didn't get the Golf GTI um, until five years after we got it in Europe. So the Mark IV anniversary in the US is not the 25th anniversary, it's the 20th anniversary. And they actually call it the GTI 337 edition and originally. Um, I don't know what 337 actually stands for. Um, but anyway, we're getting into some gray areas here. Nice car, but again, it wasn't exactly, you know, the performance car of, of the time. Um, then came the Mark V. And the Mark V obviously revolutionized. It brought the GTI back to what it should be from back in the days of the, the Mark I and the Mark II. The Mark V got GTI in standard form was brilliant, 200 horsepower, turbocharged engine. We all know the details of the Mark V Golf. For the 30th anniversary then, they brought out the Edition 30, which had more power. I think power was up from 200 to 230 brake, more torque. Um, so again, some BBS wheels, some visual changes, spec'd up to the nines. And again, apparently, you know, if you want a Mark V Golf, if you can stretch to one of these, because they do hold a premium, these are the ones to have. It's an absolute monster of a car. Um, and a big a big change from the standard car, which, which, which seemed like how it was gonna go. Um, Cause they kind of kept the recipe the same then for the Mark VI, um, more power, slightly less, slightly less um, obvious from the outside other than the, the wheels, which were uh, specifically for the Edition 35 and probably one of the best looking wheels uh, Volkswagen have ever put on a car. Not too, not too over the top with, with, the, with the design, but yeah, they're cool. Again, if you're getting a Mark VI, um, probably the one to go for is the Edition 35. So the recipe was really working. More power, some suspension tweaks, some visual tweaks, cool. Then came the Mark VII, and like they really pulled out the stops now. Um, so for the 40th anniversary, we had the GTI Club Sport and the Club Sport S. The Club Sport is the, you know, bells and whistles, more power. I think they got up to 286 in the Club Sport. Um, again, you know, bigger brakes, tweak suspension, blah, 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 blah. And then the Club Sport S went balls to the wall. No rear seats, loads of extra bracing, uh, heavily tuned suspension. I think it was manually adjustable possibly, bigger brakes, lightweight wheels. I think they pushed it up to 308 brake horsepower and they only made 400 of them. It was the, it set the record for a hot hatch around the Nürburgring. Absolute beast of a thing. It's one of those cars that hasn't depreciated for obvious reasons. Amazing. The whole anniversary Golf GTI thing was really coming on song now. And then we get this just half-assed piece of crap. The, the, the 45th anniversary, which is just a club sport with some bits stuck to it, which just goes to prove that the Mark 8 really is the start of a downward trend for the Golf. As I said before, the Mark 7 was the, the high point. So if you have one, keep it. And if you have some cash, buy one now because uh, I see the, the Mark 7 is going to be a future classic. So that's it for the uh, the, the, the car news. And um, we'll move, move on to some, some small motorsport news, Formula 1 news. And um, since, since I last spoke to you, um, two new, two of the 2021 Formula 1 challengers have been launched. Uh, first out of the gate was yesterday, was um, Mercedes with the W12. Um, slightly tweaked livery and there's more silver at the back. They went went full black last year to kind of coincide with the Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter movement, which they've continued doing. Fair play to them. Um, there's a bit more red from Ineos. Rather than having the stars on the back, they now have AMG plastered all over the back. Yeah, it's it's not a great livery. The more, probably the most worrying part is um, the big arrow. There's a big regulation change that we're having, well, big is not really the right word, but the regulation change for this season before we get the big regulation change next year is, is around the floor, which actually is a large part of the aerodynamic performance of Formula 1 cars. They've cut huge chunks out of the floor that you can't use, blah, blah, blah. 
I won't get into too much technical boring details. In the launch version of the W12, um, Mercedes had a very, very bland and clearly not the floor they're going to be using when, when the car hits the track, which is something James Allison, their technical director, has said, this is not the floor that will be on the actual racing car. And what he said is the reason it's not on this launch car is because we don't want anyone else to see it and copy it before um, we get a chance to run it on track, which uh, sounds pretty ominous. Um, you'd be crazy to bet against Mercedes not being the dominant force again this year. Um, but how dominant they're going to be is uh, is yet to be seen. And those words from James Allison um, fill me with the fear of God. Then the other car that was launched um, was the Alpine, which is going to be driven by Esteban Ocon, who was with Renault, which is essentially what this team is. It's just Renault with, with a rebrand, um, Alpine, obviously, you know, being a sub-brand of Renault, their performance version. Um, and also Fernando Alonso is coming back, uh, two-time world champion, Fernando Alonso. Um, so yeah, this is just an Evo of last year's Renault, um, but with a new livery, black, blue, white and red for France and Alpine. Pretty nice livery, I must say, um, if not too crazy. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they perform. They did take a step up um, last year as Renault. They got a three, they got two, three, pod, P, three podiums, I think. Yeah, one for Esme Knock on, two for, for Daniel Ricciardo. Um, yeah, so like they'll be hoping to, to you know, continue that performance gain. But I think Alpine, Renault, Alonso, the whole team, I think they're very much looking towards 2022 with the big regulation change before they really get in there and possibly do a title challenge. Um, how 2022 goes will be interesting, but 2023, yeah, will be interesting. We're all looking forward to 2023 because, um, sorry, 2022. I'm getting, time has lost all meaning to me in lockdown, I'm sorry. Um, yes, 2022 will be when they'll be, uh, when they'll be really hoping to bring in the the, the push towards the championship. Um, so yeah, right now it's just a bit of evolution, um, mainly just a change of name. By the time I publish this, um, Aston Martin will probably have launched their first new Formula One car. They were Racing Point, which was Force India, blah, 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 blah. They have Sebastian Vettel in now um, to go alongside uh, Lance Stroll, the team now owned by his father, Lawrence Stroll, um, a multi-millionaire, billionaire, I should say, from Canada. Um, so yeah, that car will be launched by the time this video actually goes out, um, but it hasn't actually been launched yet. Um, so I'll just put up an image of Aston Martin's last um, Formula One car, which was raced in the 1960 British Grand Prix, I think at the time. It was the, the Aston Martin DBR5. I'm not even sure if it finished the race. Um, wasn't a particularly competitive car. Um, yeah, but a good looking car. Um, and um, by the time I speak to you again, hopefully we'll have the actual Aston Martin, which would be interesting because it'd be nice to see some some green back on the uh, the Formula One grid since uh, Jaguar went uh, went tits up back in 05 and Red Bull took them over. Um, Jaguar made some terrible Formula One cars, but they did look good. So to some classified um, finds. So obviously I was talking about the uh, the ups and downs of the Golf GTI and its special editions. So I thought I'd go for an L browse to see if I could find any of the special edition anniversary models for sale in Ireland wasn't an easy thing to do uh, and the one I found was a Mark III which was the first anniversary model um, but obviously the Mark III is not exactly the most favoured of the Golf GTIs um, but admittedly this is a tidy one so it's the it's the Mark V uh, 20th anniversary Golf GTI it's the 16 valve uh, 2 litre oh sorry it's an 8 valve um, so it's not quite as revvy as, as the 16 valve um, it's got just a shade under 90,000 miles on it. Um, it's on UK plates because it's up in Antrim. Um, looks quite tidy though. It's, it's completely standard and it looks like it's been owned by an enthusiast because it's, uh, it's it's very, very clean. Um, quite pricey. Um, it's it's up for £5,985. So you're looking at what, about €6,500 before you VRT it. That's big money. Um, you're going to get yourself a decent Mark V um, golf for that kind of money. Um, but yeah, you know, it could be an appreciating classic, maybe. You know, the diehard Volkswagen fans do love a special edition. Um, yeah, you know, if you really do want a, a rare car, admittedly, the, the 20th anniversary ones are quite rare. Um, yeah, that's for sale up on Antrim. Um, 
but yeah, rich money, but tidy. And then for my classified find of the week um, or day, or I don't know how to phrase that one. Um, it's a Porsche 924S um, 1996, good year. So it's got the two and a half liter uh, Porsche engine. So it hasn't got the crappy um, van engine as people refer to it. Um, it's got the bigger Porsche unit in it. So it's, it's the one to have. Um, it looks quite tidy, I must say, from the outside and the inside. It's all standard, um, hasn't, been, hasn't been overly washed and, and detailed for the ads. It's, it's an honest looking car, both inside and out. It's a manual. Um, the ad says it does need a little bit of work, but it is running. Um, but it's only 2,750 euro. It's based in Offaly. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an intriguing, I would, if lockdown wasn't keeping me away from Offaly, because I'd be there all the time otherwise, I'd very much consider having a look at that. And if restrictions are lifted and it's still for sale, I might go look myself if someone doesn't get there before me. Um, because if it doesn't need that much work, 2750 for a 924S, there's only one way those prices are going to go. Um, even if it is the one of the lesser loved Porsches, um, it is still a classic Porsche. So, there you go, that's all I have for you today. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. Um, I apologize if I made any mistakes, I will, um, I will make up for it again. Um, I will try my hardest not to, to give you any lies. Um, but until next time, be safe, be well, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.